Welcome to the Dyslexia is Our Superpower podcast with Gibby Booth Jasper, where we hear from fellow dyslexians looking at the positives dyslexia has to offer and the many ways to succeed as a person with dyslexia. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. I'm Gibby Booth Jasper, and today my guest is author Jean Benincor. Welcome, Jean. Hi, Gibby. I'm so happy to be doing it. Thank you for thinking of me. Absolutely. Well, I've got to tell the story of how I sort of vaguely kind of know you um, without realizing it. But um, I am a massive or was for sure when I was growing up a Pony Pals um, fan. And so for people who don't know, can you tell me what we're talking about? What is the Pony Pals series? Uh, the Pony Pal series is 44 books about three girls and their ponies. Uh, I wrote them over a 10 year period. Um, they're novels for kids second, third, fourth, even into the fifth grade. Uh, I have readers who still write to me these many years later. I started the books in 1994 or five. Um, And one of the main characters, one of the three girls is dyslexic. Her name is Anna. You notice you can spell that the same forward and backwards. It's not a Ah. perfect palindrome, but it's close. And she's dyslexic. I mention it in every book. A couple of three of the plots revolve around her dyslexia and how that um, gives her special superpowers, but also is limiting in other ways. Uh, And I I had a ball writing them. It was amazing to stick with these same characters through their many adventures. Um, They would do things that take time, but time did not pass. So I was in this lovely world. I literally. I did cry when I finished the last book. I was really sad to say goodbye to the Pony Pals, Mm. but it was time. (laughs) The last pony ride. (laughs) Can you tell me the inspiration for um, for Anna in particular? Was it based on your dyslexia? It was really based on, um, I had already written My Name is Brain Brian, which is about a little boy who's dyslexic uh, and is very popular and has been super useful in the dyslexic community, as well as in general education. It's won awards and it's a strong book. Um, So when I was invited to write a series about three girls and their ponies, I definitely wanted to have one of those girls be dyslexic, but I wanted it to be like eyeglasses, you know, that's just who she is, you know, and I would mention it, but it wouldn't be like about the dyslexia, except when there were, you know, when I wanted to make it part of the plot and show that she, like my daughter and myself and my granddaughter, all of us dyslexic, um, had a talent for art, which is Mm -hmm. where where our gifts lie. So I felt, you know, I was happy to have Anna around in my life (laughs) and develop her as a character. Um, So she was inspired by the kids I've met who have dyslexia as I was writing My Name is Brain Brian and by my own family. Hmm. Well, me personally, she was my favorite character, her pony, Acorn. I had many stuffed animals and different things named Acorn um, <laughs> after that. Um, I, I didn't know at the time that I was dyslexic, but I really related with the fact that she didn't like school and that her two friends were really good at school. I know, and- I'm it's obnoxious. <laughs> Especially um, Pam. Yes. <laughs> Um, And that was something that, you know, she was totally my favorite character and I really kind of felt bonded to her for that. So just wanted to thank you. I I really, um, like I said, I I didn't say like, oh, I'm like her, I'm dyslexic, but I was able to really sort of see myself in her. So I I really appreciate it. Oh, that's interesting for me to hear. Thank (laughs) you. Absolutely. So can you sort of tell me, we're going to kind of go back in time a little bit, what your childhood was like? as far as, you know, challenges, things that you realized you were good at? I was, uh, I grew up in the 40s and 50s in Vermont. Um, and I went to a small public school in West Rutland. And I had public school teachers who really taught in a multi-sensory way. So even though I got C's in spelling, I did learn to read. Um, and I remember drawing letters in the air, that being my favorite <laughs> activity. Uh, <laughs> of course, I was punished for not getting better marks in spelling and had to write my spelling words over and over again. And then my father would be so shocked that, because neither my mother or father were dyslexic, was so shocked that I couldn't um, 
do the spelling words, even after I wrote them a hundred times, you know, maybe I'd get a C plus. Uh, and that was the whole story of my education, um, was the frustration that I felt my parents felt because I would do well in some things and I would not do well in other things, particularly foreign language. I went to a Catholic girls high school and it was all about French and Latin. Um, and I just wasn't achieving the way I was in other subjects, but I was in such a small school and I went to such a small college that I got, I got lifted up by the things I was good at. Uh, I just thought, oh, that's the way my brain works. But who knew about dyslexia? And even in the 17 years that I was a teacher uh, in English, and then eventually film studies, there was a great leap for, I got my master's in film studies. That was, a, and wrote curriculum for the public schools in film studies for kids in the 70s and 80s. And that was another way of adjusting to my dyslexia, but still not knowing I was dyslexic. I just, you know, that was when I finally found my path, was when I took film for my master's instead of uh, doing something else. Um, <laughs> and I got it while I, I wanted to do filmmaking, but you'd have to go during the day and I needed to be teaching. I needed the salary. So um, do you have like a sub question about that? Because I think I've leapt forward. Oh, you're fine. Yeah, I actually was going to ask you about as far as how did you discover that film was something that you were interested in? Uh, because I was, um, I enjoyed going to the movies. I had moved to New York from Vermont and I met someone who was doing, had done in the first graduating class in this master's program at NYU, who was also a teacher. And he talked to me about the program. So I looked into it a little bit. And then I had, I was teaching seventh grade and eighth grade in a, in a public school. And, my supervisor, I went to him for advice. I said, you know, I, I don't know. I need to get a master's as a teacher, and I can do that only at night. And I'm thinking of becoming a psychologist and then do it in the Board of Ed. Or I heard about this program, and I told him. And he was like, he was such an unhappy man. So this was so interesting. And he was at the end of his career. And I was like in my 20s, right? And he just looked at me and he said, do whatever you want. Do something you're going to really enjoy. Aww. And I was, you know, raising a child and going teaching full time and running a household. And I was like, I like the movies. I really like movies. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it was fabulous. I met interesting people. Uh, most of the time we were in the dark. I had to write papers. Didn't do so great. Oh, and I had to take the French. I had to take a French exam, a written French exam oh to get goodness. this master's. Okay. Because, you know, everybody was like about the new cinema in France. And so I took that test three times before I passed it. And the only reason I passed it was because they had a question about an African filmmaker I really admired and I knew a lot about. And they asked me a, a, a question about Simone de Beauvoir, who I admired and was, I was a feminist. So this was great. So I I had a little bit of confidence when I saw those names pop off the page of globity gluck. <laughs> and then somehow I managed to pass or it was a sympathy pass. I don't know. <laughs> and so tell us a little bit. So, okay. So you went from, you were doing the film stuff and then you started teaching and you said the curriculum. I, I designed the curriculum because no one was doing it yet. I met, met another teacher in the New York public school system who was also doing it. And we worked together and she taught in one public school, I in another. Um, and I, I taught a little bit of filmmaking, Super 8 filmmaking, which didn't even have sound then. And, um, but mostly I taught film studies classes, but I was already a full-time teacher and had been for 10 years, so. It was, okay. it was, I inserted it into the curriculum and it became an elective. And then I ended up in a high school that was devoted to media studies and I, Edward R. Murrow. And then I taught at night for extra money and a graduate program in media studies. And I taught librarians and teachers how to teach film. So, you know, it just became all part of my life. My master's degree, I wrote a book that got published called Women in Focus about the image of women in non-Hollywood films, just as feminism and 
filmmaking with 16 millimeter were beginning to take off. So I had this kind of combination thing going on, which was <laughs> great fun, I must say. I loved my teaching career. Um, but then I found out I could write stories. Uh, how did that happen? Tell I took that. it because I was teaching at night. And I, when I had a sabbatical from high school teaching, I got free courses at the new school. So I took a course in screenwriting because it was part of my curriculum. And I found out that I could write scripts. I found out I was in my 40s and I was like, oh, or maybe just turning 40. I can write fiction. And, it, you know, I wrote a good script. I was like, what? <laughs> Where did this come from? <laughs> you know, I knew I was a good teacher, but I didn't know once I could learn the kids' names, but I didn't know I could write. It was so odd because mm. writing papers, I had written this nonfiction book, Women in Focus, um, but nonfiction, it was hard for me, and fiction was so much easier. So mm -hmm. I, found, I found my gift. I was so happy and surprised. So I made all the efforts I had to, to transition into writing full-time. The blessing was that I could write scripts as well as books. So I did both. And when one wasn't paying the bills, the other was. So <laughs> I wrote 60, over 60, 70 something books. So, and loads of scripts. After school specials, I think you're too young. ABC yep. after school specials. Did you watch those? Do you remember? No, but I do know what they are. Yeah, I did a bunch of those too. Oh, cool. <laughs> Wonderful. And so you figured out that you were dyslexic in your 40s. Tell, tell me about that. So my daughter, Nicole uh, Betancourt, who's another well-known dyslexic, she was not doing well in school and hadn't done well in school. And I was always being told that she was uh, an underachiever. But I would look at her, the way her mind worked and what she was good at and what she had trouble with. And I'd go, oh, that's you know, just the way my mind works. I didn't know the word dyslexia, even though I'd been an English teacher. It just never, ever came up. So, um, oh, my God, I could have helped my students so much more if I'd known about it. So she actually had a teacher when she was a junior in high school who said that there was something really off about her reading, that she could see that she could answer some kinds of questions that had context but not others. Anyway, she was analyzing it. And at the same time, I was having my first after-school special produced, and I went to the set, and I met the mother of the star, and she, we were talking about what we did in life, and she was a teacher for kids with learning disabilities, and I'm like, what's that? And she described dyslexia, and it was like, Eureka! <laughs> so I got Nicole, we got Nicole's father, and I had her tested, and then um, the school was a very little help. Expensive private school was a very little help. I'm sure they're better now. Uh, we're, Nicole's 50, so we're talking a long time ago. And then I went to, um, I had her tutored, and she took her SATs over again. Score popped way up. And she went to Sarah Lawrence, where she had a fabulous mentors and a lot of individual education, traveled a lot, um, and took up filmmaking. So there you go. Mm -hmm. well, but anyway, so I looked at all of that and said, yep. oh, <laughs> right, <laughs> I'm dyslexic too. I mean, it was very clear to me. It never became a question. And then, of course, I did a lot of research because I was helping Nicole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so was there ever a time where it was looked at negatively or was it just like, oh, this is just how my brain works? Um, I never looked at it negatively. For Nicole, there was that whole transition because by then I was a successful children's book author and script writer, right? I, whatever it was, I had found a way. Um, I still couldn't speak. I was taking Spanish lessons and couldn't get it. I was getting lost. I still get lost in my own city after 50 years. Um, but I found that Nicole had to go through that transition that you describe in your beautiful podcast is that she had to say, oh, my God, there's a reason. And then, oh, my God, what do I do about it? Right. <laughs> so that's an ongoing thing with both of us. I mean, we if I get lost now in Manhattan or I go to 
building number 397 instead of 379. And even though I've written it in four places and then lost the paper for a doctor's appointment and then get so turned around and upset, um, I call Nicole. <laughs> we sympathize <laughs> with one. And I would go, oh, my God, it happened again. <laughs> um, after all this time, I'm going to be 77 in three weeks. It's time for it to be over, but it's not going to be over. It is who I am. You know, it's just part of it. But getting lost is really a hard thing for me. And the foreign languages is a huge disappointment because I really wanted my family really loves Central America. We spend a lot of time there. I really wanted to speak Spanish and no es posible. <laughs> so this would be a great uh, transition into, you've talked about it a little bit, but can you, for your dyslexia, tell me a little bit more about what, what are the advantages, what are the positives, and what are the things that you find more difficult? All right. The, the thing I find most wonderful is the gifts I know I have. And I, you know, now I'm looking at the end of a life. I can see the benefits that I had from that part of my brain that isn't dyslexic. Um, and I feel, you know, I belong to a very unique community and I really find that an advantage. I think when I learn more about dyslexia and have met other dyslexics and spent time with them and seen in history, the people that we can identify, there's so many we don't even know. Um, I, that's an advantage, having that community, having spent time writing about dyslexia and studying it. Um, the disadvantages I've just described, it's the foreign language, it's getting lost, it's struggling to find the word, um, wondering how this aging process is going to affect my dyslexia. You know, I still, it's so interesting, in one of, just as a sidebar, when one of my scripts, the director was dyslexic. And I could see our speech patterns were the same, that the hesitations I have when I talk because I'm trying to find words, there's this little time lapse, right? You know what I'm talking about. It's this little time lapse. And to <laughs> me, it's like this big gulf. But, you know, when I heard her speak, I was like, oh, that's what it sounds like, which was <laughs> interesting. Um, anyway, so in my, the advantage, of course, is I've been able to help Nicole and my granddaughter, you know. So. Tell me more about that. Well, with the granddaughter, Nicole and I felt early on that some of her issues had to do, because she has a complex, she has some other problems, that she was the first born, the 14-year-old who's now 14, not dyslexic. We knew right away she wasn't. And then by the time the Yulu, Blue, was five, we were like, hmm. And Nicole and I would go, hmm, when we would see what she was struggling with in school. She was in a public school. and. They, the school would go, no, 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 we, we don't think so. It's too early to test. Finally, when she was seven or eight, they, we all agreed it, this was ridiculous. So we had her tested, and she's severely dyslexic. She's more dyslexic than Nicole or I. I think I'm the least, Nicole next, and then Lou. Um, so that, you know, I was able to really help in that, you know, and could see the advantage of the school and went and looked at the schools and helped them decide which one she could go to. The only one she got accepted in, as it turned out. <laughs> um, and the co there was a wonderful coincidence. I got a phone call from, or an email from a teacher at this school, Gaynor, and, that Blue goes, Blue goes to. And they, this teacher asked me if I could come and talk to her students. And when I, you know, she read that I lived in New York. And I wrote back and said, actually, I'm going to be in your school next week for grandparents orientation. <laughs> and she was like, because Beulah was going there. So Blue and I went and I spoke to the classes and she got to see her school firsthand. And then she could be saying, this is my grandmother. She wrote the book you're reading. So it was really cute. It was very sweet. That was an advantage that I'm like this famous dyslexic author who she can be proud of and she's dyslexic and she can see that we do things. We don't just sit in the corner and suck our thumbs because we can't speak French. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about your writing process with being dyslexic. Is a lot of it, are you able to sit down and write? Do you dictate some of it? How did that work? Um, 
early on, there were no computers. But, you know, I know you find <laughs> it hard to believe. Um, but as soon as they were available, I had one. I had one that was the size of a portable sewing machine, um, <laughs> which was called portable. Uh, it, I would write in yellow pad. And I like, I like handwriting. I like cursive. I grew up, you know, having it hammered into me. Um, and, and then I would put it into a typewriter and then cut and paste. And I, make, I edit like crazy. I think you have to have a lot of humility to be a writer um, because those first drafts. Uh, and then once the computer came along, I started composing more on the computer, the better that the computer got. Uh, and especially with script writing, where there were special programs I used as they came along. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I think the fact that the first thing I wrote, besides my book for my master's, was a script, was a good thing. Because I have good audio memory of conversation or of... And then I also have great visual memories. So I had to pay so much attention to what people said, especially as a teacher, that, you know, you, you've talked a lot in your podcast about empathy and, and lots of people who are dyslexic go into social work and public service because there's compassion involved in being dyslexic somehow. Um, anyway, so... The fact that I could hear these conversations in my head helped me write dialogue, and the fact that I could put myself in those situations helped me write the scenes. And then when I started doing books, it was for a younger audience. So I, and I didn't have any trouble remembering what it was like being a kid. And I also had a kid uh, <laughs> who was the age of my protagonists when I started out. So, yeah, I've. I mean, the spelling's atrocious. My name is Brain Brian. It's called that because I had a character in another no a teenage novel, a young adult novel, that was not a very good student. And I, his name was Brian, and I kept writing Brain. <laughs> and, I <was> like, <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's the title of the book. <laughs> and then I worked on the plot from there. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, it was the way I was making a living. So I kept doing it, and I loved it. The lifestyle suited me. I like to work alone. Um, so I, I think I, it was luck, and it was also some gift. And then whatever the barriers were, I would rather have that gift than the barrier, or, you know, I'd rather be able to write good dialogue than know how to spell. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. And is reading something that's challenging for you, or is that... I do a lot of my reading in audiobooks. Okay. Um, I, I'm a, I do printmaking now, uh, copper plate etching and Japanese woodblock in a cooperative in New York. And when I'm out here in the country in Orient, I paint. I do, you know, and I've, I've showed my work um, for years. I was doing art 20 of the 30 years I was doing children's book, I was taking art classes and had that whole other part of my life. Um, so once I retired from writing, I spend my whole time now doing art and tap dancing, which is something I did as a kid. Uh, the art is just the place I go to and then I listen to books while I'm doing it. It keeps that more processy part of my brain occupied. So i much more creative. It's odd, but it's true. And I can look at certain paintings and remember the novel I was reading, reading in my ears while I was <laughs> painting. It's kind of interesting, actually. Um, and then, of course, I do read, but I read word for word. So I'm my own audiobook when I'm reading. I, I can't read otherwise. I can, in the newspaper, I can sort of scan but for novels and that sort of thing, I have to hear every single word, which is probably another reason I'm a good writer. People have said that when they read my books out loud, uh, that they're very satisfying as an audible thing. So. Can you tell me more about the, my name is, um, I'm, I'm gonna mess it up, Brain yeah. Brian. Um, as far as the inspiration behind it and a little bit more about it? 
Well, it was Nicole having, you know, I was written after she was diagnosed and I started doing all this research and recognized that I was dyslexic and um, came up with my title. It was going to be a book about a girl till I came up with the title. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, so I, that's when I went to Kildonan in upstate New York, which is a school for dyslexic kids, which was near where I had a house at the time and met other, met these children, these amazing sixth graders, sixth and seventh graders who talked to me about their dyslexia. And then as I wrote the book, I went back and visited them in, in the parts of the book where it's, there are all these dyslexic mistakes when he's writing. Those were actual mistakes these kids made. I dictated to them mm. and they wrote out in their own style. Uh, so that, that was a very important part of that process. Uh, and I wanted, I wanted this kid, Brian is not definitely understood by his family. And I really wanted that to be shown because I thought then parents who see that book can see where they might falter in terms of helping the children, their own children. Um, and I give the grandfather dyslexia. And it, it, it's a great little book. You should read it if you haven't. <laughs> no, I haven't read it. I definitely would love to. I will yeah, definitely yeah. check that out. Yeah. Okay. So, so, you know, and it was marketed as in the regular and it did very well. I still I think it came out in 1993, 90, no, 90, maybe. Anyway, it came out a long time ago and uh, it's still in print in paperback. So that's good. Mm, that's wonderful. Scholastic. <laughs> So can you, um, I always like asking this question because I love to hear people's variety of responses, but I'm wondering what your advice is for two groups of people, the main two groups who listen to the show. So we've got on one hand, the parents of dyslexic kids who may or may not be dyslexic themselves, many who are not. And then the sort of teenager, preteen who has dyslexia and is trying to kind of make sense of it all in whichever order you prefer. What would your advice well, be? Well, for the kids, um, I think search out books, especially novels about kids who have dyslexia. So you see yourself in a larger context, in a larger world. Of course, they're my books, but there are others. There are many others. And there's websites you can go to. Find your community um, and insist with the adults in your life that you are smart <laughs> and prove it by finding ways to do the things you're very good at. Uh, even though it takes you so much longer, uh, Gibby, you and I both know this, to do things like your essay or to read a book or a chapter or, you know, that there are other things that you sing at, you know, you just do so well. Um, and be sure that you have the opportunity to do those things too. And try to become an advocate for yourself. We've been teaching our granddaughter this. If there's something that you need help with, speak up and get the help you need. Hopefully you'll find adults in your life. Gibby, you talked about one in your podcast about a teacher who made all the difference. Mm -hmm. And I think we've all had those teachers. Um, find that teacher for yourself and stick by them. You know? <laughs> Let them help you. And for the parents, it's sort of the same advice. Do the research. Find out who these people are and what's so special about your kid. Uh, and if you are dyslexic yourself or have a dyslexic family member, make that connection with that child. Let them know they're not alone in the family. Uh, and do your research. Spend the time. And even though your kid needs all this extra time for homework and for learning how to read and to do math or whatever their particular issues are, be sure they get those drumming lessons. Be sure they get those horseback riding experiences, whatever it is that they feel strongly about and do well at. Um, give them those opportunities because those are going to be the things that will give them joy later in their life and can also lead to career decisions and help them decide where to go in their further learning experiences. Amen. <laughs> That's what I have to say about that. <laughs> Don't judge a person by their reading. <laughs> I love it. That's such a great place to end. Well, Jean, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. It's been an absolute honor to have you on today and to talk with you. Well, I'm happy to have done it. It's been a pleasure to go back over some of these roads again. Bye. Mm -hmm.
Bye. Thanks for listening to the Dyslexia is Our Superpower podcast. And we'd love to hear from you with comments and questions. So please feel free to get in touch. You can email us at dyslexiaisoursuperpower at gmail.com. That's dyslexia is our superpower, all one word, at gmail.com. And don't forget to spread the word by sharing us on social media. 